Good morning, everyone. Welcome back to the Montgomery County Council for our Tuesday, May 11th session. We'll now begin with a proclamation recognizing ALS Awareness Month. I'll call on Council Members Rice and Katz and our County Executive Mark Elrich. Council Members. Well, thank you very much, uh, Council Member, uh, excuse me, Council President Hucker. Um, and uh, as many of you know, um, I lost my Chief of Staff to ALS, but before I had lost Steve, Goldstein to ALS. I actually lost one of my best friend's mothers uh, to ALS, and that's what first uh, got me involved uh, in the ALS Association and the education and uh, preventative work that we continue to try and do each and every day. I now sit as a board member uh, of the ALS Association of D.C., Maryland, and Virginia, and let me just say that uh, the great work that people do to continue to educate folks about uh, the services that are provided for people who come down with ALS uh, and allow them to live out the rest of their lives uh, to the best uh, of their uh, abilities and capacities, um, we don't have to look far. We've seen on the news, many of you saw the heartwarming story of the young graduate uh, whose mother uh, has ALS who couldn't attend the graduation, and so they held a graduation ceremony at their house in their backyard. Uh, these are the kinds of accommodations that many families continue to make each and every day, understanding that their loved ones are immunocompromised uh, and can't leave the house uh, in the midst of the global pandemic. And it's one in which I just ask in a time in which there's so much turmoil, uh, there's so much of uh, back and forth about particular issues, take this day as a day of compassion. Take this day as a day of thanks uh, that you may not have to experience uh, the challenges of this horrible, debilitating disease. I saw it first and foremost as it took my chief of staff I saw it first and foremost as it took my chief of staff from an able-bodied person who led me ably throughout my political career to a man who needed me to help him to open up a soda and to lift a spoon of peas to his mouth. And each and every day, I stood by him, just like families and friends do each and every day. And now we have a good friend of ours, a person who has dedicated and sacrificed their time and life to the county, Jay Kenny, who is also with us today, who also is now challenged with this debilitating disease. I pray that no one you know or yourself ever come down with this disease. And I pray that one day we find a cure. We can do this just like we found a vaccine for COVID. We have to keep up the attention. We have to make sure that people understand that this is solvable. We have to understand what this does to people. And we have to commit ourselves to helping those who are experiencing ALS uh, to make sure uh, that they can live a better, uh, more fruitful, fulfilling life and give their families and friends all of the support that they need. This weighs heavy on my heart, but I'm thankful for the dedicated uh, people who continue each and every day, whether it's the scientists and the doctors, uh, folks who are with ALS associations all across the world for their dedication and support for families and friends and for the individuals themselves living with ALS. So I ask you today to use this as a day of giving, as a day of solace, as a day of understanding that because we can uh, live our lives and talk and smile and have conversations, um, that is not given to all of us, uh, and we need to recognize that today. Thank you very much, Council President. I'll turn to Council Member Katz. Well, thank you very much, uh, Council Member Rice. And, and uh, let me say before I start that that um, you and your staff, uh, when we, you, you, we can't have this presentation without thinking of Steve Goldstein and how dedicated he was to you and your office, but how dedicated your office was to him and his family. 
Uh, it truly was remarkable. I had heard of ALS, and I see my good friend Jay Kenny on as well, and and we are praying that we're gonna we're gonna find a cure as as we go along, and we're gonna we're gonna be in, in a better place. But I I had always heard of ALS, but I had never had a, a very good friend, a person who I would see daily with it. And Steve Goldstein was that person, and and he certainly uh, he he brought a, a smile to everybody's face before uh, he had it, and he certainly brought one even during. I mean, you knew that he was struggling, but but you didn't know he was he was struggling. He made he made everybody his priority, and so we think of Steve. I I um uh, we certainly commemorate Awareness Month, ALS Awareness Month, and. We thank the ALS Association, the D.C., Maryland, and Virginia chapter for its advocacy, its outreach, and service. ALS is a complicated, devastating disease. It's uh, estimated that nationally, nationally, at least 16,000 people have the disease at any given time. And every 90 minutes, hear that statistic, and every 90 minutes, Someone is diagnosed with the disease and someone else passes away from it. There is currently no cure for ALS. We're working on it. We're going we're gonna to get them there. We're all going to dedicate ourselves to do that. So it's critically important to continue a raise, to continually raise awareness and speak out about the need for further research and treatment. We challenge everyone who, are, who is hearing air voice to join the fight against ALS by advocating, donating, volunteering, and participating in an event. Everyone can take out their phones and go to webbc.alsa.org to learn how they can get involved. Get involved to help everyone suffering from ALS, people like our good friend Jay, who is fighting every day, Jay, I, I, I say this sincerely. I, I thank you for you being with us. I thank you for being our friend for, for so many, many years and for your hope and fighting spirit. It's truly an inspiration to every every person. And again, I thank the, the uh, ALS Association for its hard work and dedication as they continue to provide support and services to those living with ALS and to their caregivers. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to... County Executive Elbridge. Thank you. Um, I, like all the rest of us, we all share this belief that we have to continue to fight to find a cure for this disease. Um, it's 5,000 Americans will continue to get a diagnosis every year, and the global numbers are much higher. Um, you know, I grew up knowing that there was a disease called ALS, but I associated it with Lou Gehrig. And, you know, I remember his tearful goodbye at Yankee Stadium and all that, but it was remote from us. And um, with Steve getting it while he was working in Craig's office, um, that was my first up close and personal look at what it did. And uh, it was it was tough. And, you know, Steve worked on through, you know, through that for a very, very long time and the challenges of not having a body that won't do, or having a body that won't do what your brain wants it to do um, has got to be extraordinarily difficult. And so, you know, we've all seen this terrible toll up close and personal, and we've watched um, how it progressively debilitates people. So, you know, we are going to continue to support those who are fighting this disease, and the work of fundraising is critically important, as is increasing awareness about ALS. I mean, I think it's important that more people understand it and understand the importance of helping contribute to the work that's being done to find the cure or treatment for this. Um, so I just wanted, you know, wanted to be here in solidarity with the rest of you because, you know, having seen this personal, um, this is more than just uh, somebody else's story. It's the story of somebody we all know. And, I, you know, and I appreciate Jay being here today as well. So um, thank you for giving me a couple of moments here. And uh, this is important that this work get done.
Well, thank you very much, Mr. County Executive. And I want to acknowledge uh, Lynn Aronson, who's our director of the ALS Association of the DC, Maryland, Virginia chapter, and Matt Solomon, who's with us, who's our manager of government and community relations, who continue to do a great job of serving those in our community. It was not too long ago, pre-COVID, that I uh, actually saw Jay in the office in Rockville uh, having uh, a meeting there uh, with other patients. And so certainly the work, the great work of your, the association continues uh, and the support continues. I know even in the midst of COVID, uh, still outreaching to patients and giving them the services that they need. And special shout out to our Health and Human Services Department, Mr. County Executive. It's great to see that they are working with residents to make sure that for those that are homebound, we can go to them and vaccinate them with the COVID vaccine. All of those things are incredibly important. So, um, Sydney, do you wanna go ahead and read the proclamation and we can alternate with the county executive? It's fine with me, should we, I should start? Uh, I'll actually start. start. Yep, uh, whereas ALS, uh, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, also known as Lou Gehrig's disease, is a progressive neurodegenerative illness, leaving people unable to walk, talk, eat and finally to breathe and mark you want to go next do you want me to yeah okay and, uh, whereas of approximately 20,000 americans including 50 county residents are living with als with 5,000 americans receiving an als diagnosis each year and the united nations has projected that the number of als cases in the developed world will increase by 69% over the next 25 years and... Whereas ALS can strike a person of any gender, age, religion, and race, and this is a service-related disease, military veterans are twice as likely to be diagnosed, and care can cost over $250,000 a year and... Whereas the ALS Association, D.C., Maryland, Virginia chapter works to discover treatments and a cure for ALS and to serve, advocate for, and empower people affected by ALS to live their lives to the fullest and. Whereas the organization provides access to ALS multidisciplinary clinics, as well as free of charge home visits, equipment, loan closets, transportation grants, and monthly support groups and whereas the organization's Esther Lerner Brenner ALS Assistive Technology Lab in Rockville is working to open new doors for people living with ALS, allowing them to reclaim their voices and live more independently. Now, therefore, do we, uh, Mark Elrich, our county executive, Sydney Katz, and myself uh, as county council members of Montgomery County, Maryland, do hereby proclaim May 2021 as ALS Awareness Month, and be it further resolved that the County Executive and County Council encourages residents to adopt the ALS Association DC Maryland VA Chapter core values of compassion, integrity, and urgency to find a cure and create a world without ALS. Let me now turn to our Director uh, of the ALS Association for the DC Maryland Virginia Chapter, Lynn Aronson. Well, good morning and thank you to Council Member Katz, Rice, Ucker, and County Executive Mark Elrich. Uh, we certainly appreciate this proclamation very much. I also want to recognize the Council for their generosity in uh, allowing us to have a grant during the COVID crisis to maintain our level of service to our patients and caregivers family members. Uh, we, just like many other organizations, had to pivot to serve our clients in a different way, in a virtual world, but we continued the great service and programs that we are known for. Uh, you mentioned several of them in the problem. Um, we just recently completed um, a new strategic plan with some very lofty goals. Um, our overarching goal is by 2030, we want to make ALS a livable disease instead of a fatal disease. Not unlike AIDS when it was when first came out, 
people were dying in masses. It's now very manageable. Um, and uh, we want to do whatever it takes to, to accomplish that. So um, in moving forward, uh, we have adapted to the current virtual world. Hopefully, uh, sooner than later, we'll be able to see our patients and caregivers in person. Um, but nonetheless, uh, we recognize uh, one thing is that our uh, telemedicine has become so critical to our patients. They're seeing all of their um, clinicians and neurologists on, in, in a virtual setting. And uh, one thing we have started this year is uh, providing uh, spirometers, which are uh, uh, devices that me measure someone's breathing capabilities. Um, as somebody progresses with the disease, breathing becomes more and more difficult. So one of the things we're working on is to provide spirometers so that patients can be able to give their, their breathing um, capabilities to the clinicians on a monthly basis. And that's a very critical part of um, virtual care that's, that's not being met right now. Um, that's one thing. Another thing that we're trying to do is uh, a very generous donor created a fund called JT's Angel Fund. And uh, we are providing um, reimbursable grants up to $5,000 for patients and families to pay for cost of living items. As was mentioned in the proclamation, it's a very expensive disease. Uh, lots of equipment, lots of care is needed, and it can cost a family upwards of $250,000 a year. So we're trying to, um, uh, we're doing this in parts of Virginia, and we want to um, we want to be able to provide that throughout our entire chapter territory. Um, also, um, we do fund. Um, we are the largest private funder of ALS research in the country. Um, they're making great strides. More and more research is going into the pipeline. And if you know anything about the cre the development of a drug. Uh, Many, many go in and not very many come out the other end. So uh, we want to put more, um, more uh, research into the pipeline so that hopefully something positive will come out. And we're starting to see that. Um, we also do a lot of advocacy um, currently. And Matt is uh, the person uh, responsible in our chapter for our federal advocacy. We're about to have our virtual advocacy day next uh, next month. And um, we will have patients and family members speak to Congress, um, promoting uh, things like last year, we were able to waive the five-month waiting period for SSDI to kick in. Uh, before that, we were responsible as an organization for uh, reducing the waiting period to 24 months. But the reality is many patients can't wait five months for their benefits to kick in because this disease uh, often takes 12 to 18 months just to get a diagnosis. There is no one test that definitively, um, it's not like you can do a blood test or any kind of specific test. So sometimes it's process of <clears throat> elimination. And by the time they get their diagnosis, they're often in need of, 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 of uh, items and services. So we were able to, through our advocacy efforts to eliminate that last year. And we expect that we will work on uh, other, other projects moving forward. And of course, our patient services programs are paramount. Um, our, we look forward to being able to do home visits soon. Uh, we have numerous support groups throughout our area. They've all gone virtual for now. Again, it's something we, we long to see our, you know, patients and family members in person. Um, we're in June, we're going to be having a, a caregiver educational program. You know, caregivers are often the unsung heroes in this disease. It can, it can be a 24-7 process for them. 
and so they need support as well. So on behalf of the organization, I want to thank you very much for recognizing May as ALS Awareness Month. And thank you for all you do to help residents of Montgomery County. Well, thank you very much, Lynn. And uh, to Jay, Jay, we are standing right by your side along the fight. Uh, we will continue to be there for you, sir. We love you. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Council, uh, President Hucker, Mr. Katz, thank you, Executive Elrich, much appreciated. Thank you very much. And we always remember Steve Goldstein, our dear friend. Thank you. Mr. President, back to you. Thank you, guys. Th thank you all so much. That was really a wonderful proclamation. It was very nice to see you all. Now, I'll recognize National Tourism Week. National Travel and Tourism Week is a celebration and recognition of the important role that tourism plays in Montgomery County's economy. During the height of the COVID-19 pandemic, Travel spending declined 42% in the U.S. The economic impacts of this shift were felt far and wide, especially here in Montgomery County, the number one most visited county in Maryland with 9 million visitors annually. Workers in the hospitality industry got hit disproportionately hard as they made up 65% of all unemployment claims across the country, across the county. And of course, those who weren't unemployed were putting their bodies at risk on the front lines to serve our, our residents and our, our tourists. During, um, despite the unprecedented challenges that we've faced over the last year plus, those in the tourism industry have displayed incredible resilience. And we will continue our commitment to supporting and restoring all sectors of the tourism and travel industry. So welcome uh, to Kelly Vett Groff, the President and CEO of Visit Montgomery, and Corey Van Horn, the Director of Marketing. I'd uh, ask you both to uh, say a few words. Kelly? Good morning, Council President Hucker, members of the Council. Thanks for having us join today. Um, as mentioned in the proclamation, visitors spend $1.9 billion in our local economy prior to COVID, and 20 uh, the year 2020 now into 2021 has been probably the most challenging in our history. Our organization is 36 years old. Um, I want to thank my staff, Corey Van Horn, joining me today, and my other staff members, our board of directors, the county council, and the county executive's office for so much support during this time through um, grant programs, just lending an ear and giving us guidance. Um, and what I would like to finish with is just that when you're ready to travel, please get back out and travel, whether it's your backyard in the region or out of state. Uh, we want to get everybody back to work as soon as possible. So thanks again. Corey, anything you want to add? Um, on behalf of, of the tourism community, I want to thank all of the tourism members and residents and uh, council members and our county executive for all of your support uh, throughout this time as well. So thank you. Uh, thanks to you both. Let me uh, read the proclamation. Whereas National Travel and Tourism Week is a recognition of the vital role that the tourism industry plays in our local economy and its importance in bringing back our vibrant communities, restoring the economy and rebuilding our workforce. And whereas travel spending in the US declined 42% during the pandemic, wreaking havoc for the industry and its workers who made up 65% of all national unemployment claims. And whereas Montgomery County's travel industry is a powerful economic engine, in 2019, Montgomery County was the most visited county in Maryland with 9 million visitors annually and almost $2 billion in economic impact for our local economy. And whereas Montgomery County, which is a hub for the hospitality industry, is a highly desirable travel destination with our extensive array of national, state, and regional parks, diverse arts and cultural attractions, delicious global dining options, and our community's unique character. And whereas, while we have faced extraordinary challenges in the past year, Montgomery County and the travel industry showcased incredible resilience as we lifted each other up, assisted one another, and continue our commitment to supporting and restoring all sectors of the industry. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the County Council of Montgomery County, Maryland, hereby recognizes National Travel and Tourism Week 2021, presented on the 11th day of May, and signed by myself. Thank you all for everything you're doing, and we look forward to traveling and uh, reopening very, very soon.
And now we'll uh, move on to our final proclamation, recognizing the council member for a day. Is council member Rice back with us? Great. I am, and thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Um, let me just start, start off by saying that uh, this is an amazing, amazing, amazing opportunity. Uh, and I couldn't be more happy about uh, the outcome. Uh, many of you, and I want to thank all of my council colleagues, have continued to support this Council Member for a Day program. I remember the last time that we did this in person at the celebration. I think every single one of you were there. And so um, I'd like to ask for all the colleagues who were on if they could turn on their cameras because this is for all of us. This is not just my program. This is us, uh, council members, uh, acknowledging our next uh, council member for a day. This is the sixth year uh, that we've done the council member for a day program. And we originally started it off as an essay program, uh, an opportunity for students to talk about uh, issues uh, that are affecting them and their communities, and that they wanted to educate us as council members. We know all too well, whether it's our teen town halls and other type of events where we get to hear from our young people about things that are affecting them in their lives, and we understand just how effective storytellers they are at being able to talk about things that are affecting them and what we need to do to help them uh, so that they can continue upon their journey towards adulthood. And, you know, the winner, uh, the great thing about this, has an opportunity firsthand to see how it is that we do and enact policy here in Montgomery County. But more importantly, what I think is the biggest part of this is that students understand that we're listening to them, that we understand that we value them, value their voice and their issues. And I really want to take uh, time to thank our partnership this year because it went to a whole new level. We had Apple involved, Montgomery County Public Schools, Montgomery College, uh, the iographer uh, organization. And so uh, having this new iteration called Voices, virtual, online, and innovative uh, and civically engaged storytelling um, really was just absolutely amazing. And, you know, our communications team, I can't thank them enough, uh, ably led by uh, Sonia Healy and the entire team who've continued to support and really want to give a shout out to Sonia because it was Sonia and I's conversation some six years ago that actually started this program. Uh, so really want to thank her for her leadership. So I want to start off uh, with this video uh, that our comms team put together. We know how great Susan Kennedy uh, and Mike Springer thar. So we're going to run uh, the video for council member for a day. Do we have that teed up, guys? Good afternoon and welcome to the Council Member for a Day Film Fest. Lifting your voice about something that you cared about in the community and doing it in a reporter style way. During the pandemic, mental health has become a challenge for many. Separate educational facilities are inherently unequal. We fought for equity and we're continuing to advocate for inclusivity on all fronts. And now, the envelope please. And the council member for a day is Healthy Eating Disorders Among Teenagers by Allison Fan from Churchill High School. I advocate for issues that I care about. Like a lot of kids might want to be able to create videos, but they might not have the resources or the knowledge to be able to do so. But um, the council member day for a challenge um, provided me with everything I needed to know about like editing, iMovie, camera, and like the iPad had Google Docs and all of that. 
So it was really just everything rolled into one and it made it really easy and you can just focus on what you want to talk about. You don't have to focus on all those other things. I was just excited about the opportunity just because it's an opportunity for, for students to tell stories. And, you know, I, I enjoy the technical aspects of, of putting, you know, these pieces together, but I think it's it's really about the stories that, that makes it compelling. And I think each of these students that produced pieces um, put together stories that were interesting and unique, and, and that's kind of what's attractive about doing something like this. And there are a lot of issues that kind of end up being lost uh, in the shadows. I didn't know racism really impacted Asian Americans. And until somebody speaks up about it, Environmental inequity is an extension of the existing societal inequities in America. We don't really know about it and don't really have a way to address it. Really surprisingly, like, pleasantly, to see the support that I got from like all the YouTube comments on the live stream and everyone congratulating me and telling me how my video inspired them it made me feel really good to know that I made a difference. Wow. Well, thank you very much to Susan Kennedy and Mike Springer. And you got to see uh, just a snippet of some of the amazing videos that were produced. And it was incredibly hard to even just pick the top five that were featured in the film festival that Montgomery College ran uh, on their channel and hosted. Um, you got a glimpse of the winning video, which we'll see in a moment, uh, the winner and her instructor. Uh, and so uh, Mr. Inches, it, it, it is actually a superstar because he actually helped the winning two, uh, <laughs> the top two videos. So, so that says something there and says something about our great teachers uh, in the role that they continue to play in terms of shaping and helping uh, to lift up our students. But joining us today after, after we run this video uh, of uh, Allison's uh, uh, healthy eating disorders, uh, we have Andrew Inches, who's the coordinator for Broadcast Journalism Academy at Kennedy High School. Uh, one of our Voices instructors, and uh, specifically Allison's instructor through the Voices program, uh, Brandy Heckert, who's the principal of uh, Churchill High School, uh, where Allison is a student. So thank you, Principal Heckert, for being here. And of course, our council member for a day, Allison Fan. So let's run the video, our winning video for council member for a day, Healthy Eating Disorders Among Teenagers. Tiny waists and slim figures are often considered the ideal body and many teens make it their goal to look just like that. But they may not realize that the cost of getting that kind of body could be their health. Around 30 million Americans suffer from eating disorders, 95% of which are between the ages of 12 and 25. I developed an eating disorder in the fall of 9th grade. I would weigh myself obsessively all the time and only eat a few spoonfuls of food. Thoughts of food and weight consumed my every waking moment, and I no longer cared about anything else. And I was not the only one. One of my friends would trick her parents into thinking that she ate lunch by either throwing it away or giving it to friends. Another one restricted herself to eating only 1,200 calories a day, which is roughly half of what a teen needs to stay healthy. In fact, eating disorders are the third most common chronic health condition among teenagers. But despite their prevalence, less than one in five teens ever receive treatment for their eating disorders. And this could seriously impact teens' health. In my case, I experienced loss of bone density as a result of lack of nutrition. Because of this, I fractured three bones in the span of six short months. But it could have been even worse. Anorexia, one type of eating disorder, has the highest death rate out of any mental disorder for women and girls between 15 and 24. It's important to educate students about this mental illness from a young age. One solution I propose is making eating disorders a larger part of the school health curriculum. Research has shown that health education in schools have positively affected students in oral health, accident prevention, sexual health, and nutrition education. The number of eating disorders is on the rise. Now more than ever, it is vital that we as a county stop eating disorders from affecting any more students. I hope that the Montgomery County leadership can help all students lead the happy, healthy lives that they deserve. Well, um, as the father of two girls, let me just say that, uh, Allison, your story stuck with me on so many levels uh, because it's not talked about often. 
Um, but it's something that unfortunately uh, a lot of young women are challenged with. Uh, and especially now in this day and age of social media, uh, whether it's Instagram, TikTok, all the videos that are out there, the filters that are there that change people's appearance, uh, the pressures uh, that are on our young people, especially on our young women, on how they look um, is deeply affected. And so um, just really want to thank you for sharing uh, your compelling story with all of us. Uh, the message on health eating disorders is an incredibly important one. Uh, the video production skills, uh, the usage of the apple and the withered apple showing the ones who aren't getting the help, all, all those kinds of visual pictures are just absolutely tremendous and help to tell the story. And so I am going to turn it over, but just wanted to give a round of applause from myself and all of my colleagues to our new council member for a day, Allison Fan. Thank you. Allison, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Uh, good morning, everyone. It's an honor to be here today and to be recognized for my video and the issue of eating disorders. So I'm Allison Fan, and I'm a 10th grader at Winston Churchill High School. I want to thank Council Member Rice and his office for the Council Member for a Day program. I also want to thank my instructor, Mr. Inches, for his guidance and my school, Winston Churchill High School, for its support. The issue of eating disorders is very important to me and I know firsthand how an eating disorder can affect the life of not only the person who has it, but the people around them. When I first developed an eating disorder about a year and a half ago, it was like a giant vacuum in my life just sucking away all my physical and emotional energy and time. Eventually, it got to the point where my eating disorder began to take me away from normal everyday functioning. I would eat separately from my family because I felt their food was too unhealthy, and I would literally weigh every bit of food I ate so I can control my calories. I couldn't concentrate in class, and I didn't want to do anything. Even things I enjoyed, like socializing with friends or going ice skating, which I used to do every day, because my half-starved brain didn't have the capacity to think about anything besides food. Ever since my recovery, I've wanted to talk about this because I feel like the issue of eating disorders isn't often discussed and a lot of people might not realize how big of an impact they can have. I also felt like talking about my experiences and what I went through might help others who are struggling with the same thing. And so when I found out about the Council Member for a Day program, I was really excited because not only did it provide me with an opportunity to talk about an issue that I care deeply about, it also gave me a voice and allowed me to communicate my message directly to county leadership, which is just really cool and something I never even imagined I would have been able to do. The program provided us with all the devices and tools needed for filmmaking and the speaker sessions taught me a lot about storytelling and the importance of engaging public policy issues. From the council member's office to the instructors, everyone worked so hard in helping us succeed in this program. And without their dedicated instruction and encouragement, I would not have been able to produce this video. This entire experience has just been so encouraging and it's just really rewarding knowing that my story was able to help others with eating disorders and impact the community. I really hope that more students can participate in and benefit from this program in the future. And thank you all again, and I look forward to being council member for a day. Well, thank you very much, Allison. And you can see uh, colleagues from just her uh, explanation afterwards why uh, this resonated uh, throughout the video. Um, it is really, truly exciting, uh, Allison, and we look forward to a day when you're going to be with us. It won't be today. Uh, colleagues, because uh, we know that Allison has school <laughs> and want to be uh, sensitive to uh, her class. So we're going to work with her principal and her teachers on uh, getting a Tuesday that works for all of us so that she can come and spend uh, part of the day with us and um, see everything that it is that's done on the county council. So with that, uh, I'm going to go ahead and read the proclamation. Um, and uh, then I want to turn it over uh, to our uh, um, council president, who may want to say a, a few words as well. Um, whereas Allison Fan, a sophomore at Winston Churchill High School, participated in the sixth annual Council Member for a Day program that required participants to create a video describing a public policy issue and offering a call to action and 
whereas the council member uh, for a day program was created to spark interest in provide access to local government operations, deepen an understanding of and promote activism about public policy issues that are important to our young people by shadowing the Montgomery County Council Chair of the Education and Culture Committee for a day. And whereas this year, the council member for a day challenge was enhanced, taking it to a new level through a partnership with Montgomery County Public Schools and Montgomery College to offer a robust eight week curriculum on inclusive storytelling through digital journalism. And whereas Ms. Fan submitted an exceptional video, Healthy Eating Disorders Among Teenagers, that movingly and courageously described Allison's own disorder, how others are impacted by eating disorders, and urged improved education on eating disorders in the school health curriculum. And whereas Ms. Fan's winning video demonstrated her passion, her depth of knowledge, creativity, and compelling video production skills and created a true call to action for our educators and elected officials to address eating disorders among teenagers. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the County Council of Montgomery County, Maryland, hereby congratulates Allison Fan, and be it further resolved that the County Council recognizes her service to Montgomery County as the 2021 Honorary Council Member for a day. Again, congratulations, Allison and we will make sure we get a day that works for you and you can come and join us uh, uh, on the virtual dais. Thank you. Council President. Thank you so much, Council Member Rice. Um, let me first call on Council Member Katz who has something to add. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President, and congratulations, Allison. I wanted to take a special moment. My daughter, Stephanie Burroughs, actually is the administrative secretary at uh, at Churchill. And I know that she would yell at me if I didn't say hello to her today and, and to congratulate you, Allison. And I wanted to say hello to, to Brandy Heckert, the, the principal at Churchill. Brandy, I have to tell you, of all the, the uh, screensavers that we've seen, I think yours was the absolute best with the bulldog on it. So anyhow, thank you. Congratulations. We look forward to working with you and we will see you again. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, thank you, Council Member. Uh, thanks uh, to Andrew and Brandy as well. And um, Allison, congratulations. That was a fabulous video. And the only thing more compelling than the video was your testimony to us about uh, what motivated you and how you arrived at uh, this issue and, and your communication of it. So welcome to the Montgomery County Council. Uh, thanks again to Council Member Rice for putting this fabulous program together. Um, Alice, I know all of us are really impressed by your activism and your passion. Uh, I'll have to appoint you to the HHS committee and the education committee, uh, and we hope you'll save time for a little peer review of our communications office while you're with us. So uh, thanks again and congratulations, and we look forward to seeing you again soon. Mr. President, I, I think Councilmember Friedson had a oh. point of privilege. Councilmember Friedson. Uh, yes, thank you. I just wanted to congratulate Allison. Uh, I can't wait to have a second Churchill Bulldog on the uh, on the on the virtual or actual uh, dais. And uh, just uh, as uh, somebody who uh, went to Churchill, you make me proud, make the whole school community proud, and just wanted to uh, to say that and uh, really appreciate uh, your your courage and your conviction on such an important issue facing so many of our young people. And really, it is a, a testimony. Uh, to so many uh, people uh, like you and, 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 and really a, a reminder how our young people are really forcing us to confront issues that for too long have not been publicly discussed and need to be publicly addressed. So thank you so much for that. Thank you to Principal Heckert and Andrew and uh, everybody who's been supporting you and uh, appreciate that and look forward to having you join us sometime very soon. Thank you. We'll see you all again soon. Congratulations again to Allison. Take care, Allison. Thank you, everyone. Now we can move on to general business. Madam Clerk, can you please share the announcements, agenda changes, or petitions we have? Yes, good morning. We do have an addendum on the consent calendar, item three added, 3N. Introduction, special appropriation to the county government's FY21 operating budget, Montgomery County Economic Development Corporation non-departmental account, 
support for COVID-19 response restaurant relief program, $3,826,998. Source of funds, state grant and amendment to FY21 operating budget resolution 19-472, section G, designation of entities for non-competitive contract award status, Montgomery County Economic Development Corporation. Public hearing action is scheduled for 5-18-21 at 1.30 p.m. Also added to the consent calendar, 3-0, introduction, special appropriation to the county government's FY21 operating budget, Office of the County Executive, support for COVID-19 response, hotel relief program, $1,739,444, and online sales program, $86,977, totaling $1,826,521, source of funds, state grant. Public hearing action is scheduled for 5-18-21 at 1.30 p.m. That is all, Mr. President. Thank you so much, Madam Clerk. Um, colleagues, the clerk has also distributed the minutes to council members for the meetings of February 11th, 22nd, and 23rd, and for the closed session meeting of April 20th. Are there any changes? Hearing no objection, the minutes are approved as submitted. Now we can sit as the Board of Health, Dr. Gales and Dr. Stoddard. I think we're ready for our update, if you're with us. Welcome. Good morning. Good morning. How's everyone? Good morning. Um, uh, first, before getting into to things, a, a couple of general announcements and comments. Uh, I'd like to say congratulations to uh, Allison uh, for her amazing video uh, and her amazing advocacy and willingness to share her story. I think in many instances, we as adults uh, dismiss the power of our young people. Um, and it reminds me of a quote, uh, I had the fortune of taking a, a class with Bill Raspberry as an undergraduate. Uh, and uh, Mr. Raspberry wrote for the Post for many years. Uh, and we were all in awe of his class. Uh, and we were afraid to talk because we're like, you're the expert. You have, you know, you. we took the class to hear from you. And in the first class, he reminded us that he wanted to hear our voices because regardless of how many degrees, we had or whatever prestige we had, we brought to the table 20 to 21 years of our own individual experience, and we were experts in that experience. And so I would say to uh, all of the young people who are watching or maybe watching in the future uh, to, uh, to not be afraid to give voice to your experience and give voice to the things that are important to you and continue then you to stand up and be an advocate for yourself and your fellow students. Uh, and also kudos to Mr. Inches and Principal Hecker for supporting uh, the students and creating platforms. And I know you all, you all aren't the only principal and student uh, teacher who's supporting their students, but thank you for your continued support and advocacy in that. And thank you all as the council for putting forward uh, such a great program uh, and highlighting the work of our young people. Uh, and I would also like to say uh, thank you for the advocacy around ALS uh, and hearing that presentation. Uh, I have had the privilege of working with Mr. Kenny, uh, and he is a top-notch individual, and it was great to see him uh, as part of that presentation. Now, to shift to uh, the business at hand today uh, in terms of our uh, COVID update, uh, and I am going to attempt to share my screen and based upon the lessons I learned last week about the power of the F11 button. All right, there we go. Uh, and before we get into that, uh, a couple of things to highlight. The first uh, one is that uh, we have continued to see our community transmission levels uh, decrease. Uh, as you can see here, uh, our case rate uh, is dropped, Signet continues to move uh, down and into the low range. Uh, additionally, our test positivity has been below 2% multiple days, and we've continued to make great progress in that area. 
indicative of the resilience of our residents, as well as uh, the restrictions and, and policies that we've put into place throughout uh, the pandemic, particularly in the setting of increasing our rates of vaccination for our residents. I would also like to say this too. So often we, at least in the public health side, we talk about things in the context of numbers. We've had to, because from a health perspective, we've been tasked with keeping cases down, keeping hospitalizations down, and keeping fatalities down. These are, are, real, are real issues in the terms of a, a pandemic. But we also recognize in making those decisions and determinations and putting forth that guidance, that, that those guide, guidance and guidelines have had real repercussions um, on, on folks' livelihoods. Uh, and uh, as was discussed with tourism, tourism has been affected. Restaurants have been affected. The daily routines of people's lives have been affected. And those of us in the health field are hopeful that, God forbid, we go through a pandemic again or a similar situation is that we don't have to pit science and health versus uh, economic realities for folks. And so we, I just want folks at home to understand that we are not insensitive to those issues. We're just continuing to put forth guidance to keep people safe uh, and create an opportunity for economic development packages and policies and proposals to be put forward to address those other economic uh, realities of the lived experience. So as we move forward, uh, as you know, with the Board of Health resolution from several weeks ago, we uh, included uh, metrics related to the percentage of those vaccinated to reopening. And when we look at our uh, data here, we're seeing a slower increase in the percentage of residents who received at least one dose, uh, as that is now approximately 56%. Uh, and that is showing a slowdown of folks coming in to get the vaccine compared to where we were earlier on throughout vaccine distribution. At the same time, however, uh, given that we saw such a, a high percentage of folks getting covered about a month ago and six weeks ago and two months ago, those folks are coming in now and getting their second doses. And so when we look at the number uh, of those who have been fully vaccinated or have received both doses, that number by our immunet standards are 43%. I believe the CDC graphic is a little bit closer to 47%, maybe 47.5% this morning. And again, we're defining fully vaccinated as individuals who receive both doses or the single Johnson & Johnson dose and then being two weeks out from that. So just to give you a sense of where we stand in terms of those percentages, again, I am confident and hopeful, for example, now that the other big announcement that has come out overnight is that uh, the FDA has given uh, or provided approval uh, for uh, the Pfizer vaccine to be used for those who are 12 to 15 and the uh, Commission for the immuniza for Im on Immunization Practices uh, will meet on tomorrow to give the full final approval uh, and potentially the vaccine will be eligible to those folks in that age category as early as Thursday. I am confident and, and hopeful that with bringing in that increased eligibility that that will increase uh, this percentage on the left, uh, the, those getting at least one dose fairly quickly within the short term to get us moving forward to that next level of uh, reopening. And just to continue to move through here as we've looked through in our previous presentations, uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about the vaccine plan for young people at the conclusion of the slides, but this just again gives you some uh, indication of the percentages of folks by age and race and ethnicity. And again, when we look at the weekly volume, we are seeing a drop in uh, the number of folks who are coming in for that first dose, again, compared to where we were at earlier stages in vaccine distribution. Again, to underscore, the communications team is working to focus messaging on that uh, 21 to 35-year-old group, and we are working with our colleagues, both in the public school system as well as our non-public schools, to do some focus messaging to parents and kids to ensure that, again, when that eligibility is officially increased, that they will come in and get the vaccine. Uh, this is just a cumulative total of where we stand in terms of the doses provided as well as administered. 
And again, showing the breakdown where our residents are getting their doses. Again, the county health apparatus appears to provide, continue to provide the greatest percentage of those doses to our residents. Again, some geographic representation of our uh, residents receiving at least one dose. Uh, yet another graphic uh, depicting that. And then here's our uh, our top tier zip priority zip codes based upon the impact of COVID so far that we've seen throughout the pandemic and vaccine distribution. Right. And so just a couple of notes um, beyond the slides and updates. So as I mentioned, uh, the FDA did give approval for uh, 12, the Pfizer vaccine to be used for 12 to 15 year olds and the ASIP commission will be meeting on tomorrow uh, to give the final go ahead. And we are planning for that eligibility to be increased and go into effect on, excuse me, Thursday. Now, a couple of steps that have been put into place already to help prepare for that. Um, as we talked about last week, we have been working and preparing for this, knowing that it was going to happen is that if you are uh, in that age group, you can pre-register on the county website. There are provisions in place for you to register your child for that. Um, secondly, there has been uh, a lot of discussion related to the issue of consent and how that can be provided. The guidance that we've received so far is that parents will need to be present with their child uh, when getting the vaccine. Uh, to do an age attestment for the child as well as to sign the consent on site for them. Um, and we are, by increasing eligibility on, you know, let's say, for example, it does go in there. If everything goes smoothly as anticipated with the hearing tomorrow and Thursday morning, uh, when folks wake up, 12 to 15 year olds are eligible for the Pfizer vaccine. They will be able to utilize any of the county sites where we do have vaccination in place, where Pfizer is being uh, distributed, as well as any of the other venues throughout the state where Pfizer uh, is distributed. I want folks to understand that so they can register uh, or now we have moved to a walk-up system. They would be able to walk up to any of those sites and get a vaccine just as any other resident in the county. Again, it's specific to Pfizer. And based upon our allocations from the state over the last six weeks, we have been receiving almost exclusively Pfizer doses. So young people in that age group, parents, you could bring them to any of those sites. Now we are working to uh, I start recognizing that with parents having to come with their kids, at least uh, in the short term, is that there may be some challenges for folks having to take off during the middle of the day or needing to have after hours or weekend hours. And we are working to set up some youth specific clinics that are in the evenings as well as the weekend. So we don't have those finalized just yet, uh, but please stay tuned. We're aiming to uh, stand up uh, a couple of those uh, later this week and over the weekend. Uh, and again, just to remind folks is that when eligibility is officially confirmed, uh, any of those young people are able to utilize any of the pre-existing uh, sites that are offering Pfizer throughout the county. Uh, one other update, a couple of other updates to include, uh, as you know, we have been working with uh, FEMA uh, to do uh, strike teams to provide additional support. Uh, they reached out to us to provide two uh, fixed sites for approximately seven to 10 days uh, during early June. Uh, and to provide 200 doses a day. We have been working with them to finalize those two locations. One will be in up county and one will be in down county, most likely in the east county area. We're finalizing the MOUs for that, but we do have a couple of sites selected and once they are official, we will make that announcement and pronouncement to the community. We continue to work through our list of folks uh, on our homebound list. Over the weekend, uh, we were able to, the team was able to vaccinate approximately 25 individuals. We still have approximately 185 names on our list. I do know at least, we did receive at least one message this morning 
from a member asking about a family member who had, not their family member, but someone, in, a resident in the community who had asked about their family member moving, uh, getting vaccinated. We're continuing to move through the queue, so please stay tuned and continue to uh, uh, make sure you follow those guidelines to minimize any risk of exposure to your, your family member who is homebound. Uh, those are the global updates that we have um, from the public health side. Um, I will stop there uh, and uh, turn the floor over to Dr. Stoddard. I'm happy to answer any questions that you all may have. And I think I covered everything. I don't know if Dr. Bridges is on, if there's any additional items to include, but certainly we're happy to answer any questions that you all may have. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I don't have any additional updates. Just want to um, offer my congratulatory remarks to all of the individuals who participated in the uh, uh, junior um, um, board members. Allison, great public health message. Look forward to uh, you participating in the either the council sitting as a board of health or any HHS related committee sub meeting. So thank you all. Thank you, Dr. Stoddard. Good morning, and I'll echo all the comments. Allison, great work. Uh, very much appreciate uh, all of the uh, all of our young people participating and getting involved. A um, few things I want to add. So, just just um, I think it came across in Dr. Yale's uh, comments, but I want to make sure this is a real strong point. We have gotten through our entire pre-registration list. Uh, all, the only names rel remaining on our pre-registration list are names uh, for which they provided a zip code outside of Montgomery County and and actually outside the state of Maryland. So um, that's progress. Um, a few things. So we did a text messaging campaign last week. I think it uh, uh, took place largely on May 5th, but in a couple of days after that as well, where we targeted uh, areas where we thought um, we had uh, disproportionately low vaccination rates, particularly in black and brown communities. We sent out 147,000 text messages to individuals trying to encourage them to come in and get vaccinated. Uh, as, a, as an additional outreach message, method uh, in addition to the work that we've been doing with our um, census count teams, our CCC teams, uh, in getting out and getting people uh, scheduled for appointments, uh, direct outreach for those. Uh, Dr. Gale has already touched on the MVU, uh, the mobile vaccination unit from the state. We have our mobile teams that are already here supporting efforts, including expansion of the hours at the Silver Spring Clinic, but they'll have the actual large van here next week on the 18th through the 23rd, and then again on uh, June 4th through the 13th. Uh, I believe we are targeting the Lake Forest Mall for next week, and then we have a, a additional, uh, we have not finalized the plans for the following week, looking at several sites, trying to get more community-based sites, mm -hmm. uh, so more to come on that. Um, the, um, I, I did want to note one thing that we did hear from the state this morning, and that is that some people were already attempting to make and may have successfully made appointments at some of the state sites for individuals 12 to 15. Just realize that absent that CDC and ACIP approval, they will not be able to honor appointments today and tomorrow until the ACIP meets. So if you were able to, uh, through the state system, to make an appointment at a state uh, site for a 12 to 15 year old, just realize that you will not, they will not provide you that vaccine until um, the CDC approves and MDH uh, uh, gives the all clear for those appointments. And as Dr. Gale said, that will likely come uh, on Thursday or soon thereafter. Um, you will have seen our announcement yesterday that uh, there will be six libraries opening at the end of, or, you know, I think June 1st, and then two senior centers there being opened um, uh, in the press release. Uh, at the county executive's direction, they're already proceeding with additional uh, work to prepare additional libraries uh, and uh, recreation facilities to open soon thereafter. As was noted in the press release, there are still two, uh, senior, two, two senior centers being used as vaccination sites, that's Wheaton and Wake Oak. One's being used as a shelter, which is Long Branch, and two, um, uh, the Margaret Schweinhardt and the North Potomac are being used for youth activities, and those will not open until August of this year, given that they're being used for youth summer camps and allowing for the expansion of, of those efforts. Um, and then finally, we did receive yesterday, finally, after much, um, much waiting, the Treasury guidance for the ARPA funds that came in at like 1 o'clock yesterday afternoon. Uh, the county attorney and the Office of Management and Budget are reviewing those right now to give us some direction on how those funds 
maybe utilized, particularly as it relates to the spending, as some may realize, but probably not all, those funds are going to come in two tranches, one this May, one next May. And there's a lot of questions about how the the May of next year funding and when May of next year funding can be utilized. Can we utilize it now and then sort of through through the bookkeeping process, book those costs to those dollars that will be uh, arrived next May? That's what we're reviewing the documentation for today, and I don't I don't have an answer for that yet. But I did want to share that we did receive the the Treasury guidance for those funds, and we're actively reviewing them to um, to answer those questions. That's all I have for this morning. Happy to take any questions. Thank you so much to all of you, uh, Councilmember Reamer. Thank you. Appreciate the briefing this morning and. Uh, Again, you know, it's so nice to be able to see progress. I think we're probably all alarmed by the slowdown of appointments, but we also know that we knew that was going to happen. I think uh, it's sort of amazing how far we've gotten through. Um, I have a couple of quick questions. Um, you know, generally, I, I wanted to just clarify again. So, Dr. Gales, I think you said that pre-registration with the county is now open for 12 to 15, and you can now register with the state for 12 to 15. You may or may not be able to get an appointment at a pharmacy or a hospital yet, but in any case, likely, likely tomorrow after ACIP has issued, you know, that is the first opportunity for any administration of doses probably Thursday, I think actually Dr. started that. Likely Thursday, mm -hmm. that would be the first opportunity for actually any, any 12 to 15 year old to get vaccinated. So those who want to be, you know, early in line, those are your channels. All right, great. Just wanted to make sure I had that right. Thank you. Um, and um, I'm glad to hear about the student outreach campaign. Thank you for, for working on that. Um, I would love to see us adding more resources to the homebound operation. I don't know if our clinics, you know, if we have teams that are just aren't yet being fully utilized, or they aren't being fully, fully utilized just because of the fewer appointment and we could beef that up. But uh, I imagine that there are a lot of families that are getting very anxious about whether they will be reached and they're, they're unclear you know what why it may not have happened yet um okay the the general question i have is about our reopening framework and i and i know this goes as much to my colleagues on the council as anyone but it seems like we are converging with stage two and stage three in the potential timing that you know given we have a 95 percent roughly success rate with second doses you know, it, it could be that we'll hit uh, we'll hit our threshold for county residents who've had both doses, you know, by the end of the month. Um, I, I will say when we first adopted the, the framework, I thought we were adopting a framework that said once, once they have been administered their second dose, uh, as opposed to the additional time that it takes to get to full immunity, which is the text of the language. But, um, I, I, you know, first question I have is, if we hit stage three sooner than stage two, you know, our, is, is our health team comfortable with just proceeding based on stage three? Um, and then, you know, well, that, that, that's my first question. Uh, if I could just ask Dr. Gales and Dr. Stoddard and team about that. Sure. Well, thank you, Councilmember Member, for your question. Uh, you do bring up a good point based on the way the numbers are going. However, I would say that we are still more likely to hit phase two before phase three, given that the phase three definition is based upon the two weeks after we hit that, that number. So in looking at the numbers, I would still speculate that uh, even if we were to hit 50 percent, we'd still have that two week window. And I do think that there is within that time period, maybe even about the same time, again, given that we've got young, more young people being eligible for the vaccine. And I do anticipate that there will be an influx of parents bringing their kids in for that protection, uh, that we could, there would still be a phase two and then a phase three. Uh, but again, I, I think the, if we were to hit the 50% 
protection level. Uh, again, I, if we put forward the guidance there, I think we would be at a place where we would be able to move forward with that guidance. Thank you. As I was talking, as I was saying the words, it became clear to me that, you know, as you, as you explained, thank you. Okay, well, generally, I just want to say, you know, in the beginning of the pandemic, I think it was so important for us to be ahead of the curve on shutting down and enacting strong protections. Um, I, I think we've reached the point now where we we need to start thinking about being ahead of the curve on reopening. Our cases are fortunately down at the lowest level they've been throughout the pandemic. And, you know, just thanks to the nature of that because of both the combination of the vaccination campaign and the fact that people can now do more outdoor socializing. You know, it just doesn't seem like there's a theory that would lead to a resurgence of the virus. And so, you know, I, I think it's, it's urgent. They have other urgent public health issues that are affected by our shutdown. You know, the, the lack, the social isolation, you know, the lack of, of gathering, I think is its own problem. You know, as we all know, you know, we've, we, we are grappling with those problems all along. And I think we've kind of hit that inflection point where we've got to get, I was, you know, speaking with a friend the other day who was so worried about her mom because being isolated causes decline for people who are, you know, older, like very much older. And she's worried that her mom, her mom's decline and may be irreparable uh, because of this past year. You know, those are very real consequences as well. And I think we've just got to ensure that we are leaning into reopening now um, and, you know, moving as fast as possible. So certainly that applies to, to public facilities, um, but, you know, it applies to private as well. I, I do wanted to ask, there's been a little confusion. I think we're all probably, I know that two that full immunity is like full immunity, like you're 96% unlikely to catch the virus or, you know, it's 96% protection depending on your, your vaccination. And then it's 100% protection from serious illness. Uh, I don't know if there's ever been a case of serious illness documented with someone who has reached full immunity. Um, what, what, what is your general guidance for people who have had Full, who have reached full immunity now. You know, there are a lot of people in the community who I think are, you know, glad to have full immunity, but still we're all so, I want to say we're all so traumatized by this experience that, that many people don't know how, what is safe and, and what to do. So can you just talk a little bit about what you would suggest for people who have reached full immunity, even if they're uh, a bit older or maybe, um, you know, like there's a lot of folks in that category. They were the first to get vaccinated, uh, you know. So what should we all be comfortable seeing around us and what should we be comfortable doing as, as people? Thank you. Well, I, I think there'll be multiple answers on this one. So uh, I'll try to keep my piece succinct on this. I, to give you an example, uh, you're right. So we have been asked to do a lot of things over the last year uh, and there is going to be this ongoing um, I've seen a lot of articles pop up from one side or the other talking about, you know, how far is too far and, you know, how do we, we mix that in? What I can give you is an example of this weekend, uh, I visited my parents, uh, for Mother's Day and my parents were fully vaccinated. Uh, my family members who were included in that fully vaccinated, aunts and uncles fully vaccinated because they fit that older group that you mentioned. I don't know how comfortable they'd like me saying that, but they do fit that older group. I had the same hesitancy in saying those words. Yeah, and that, that older group. Uh, but we were able to get together as a family. We had a barbecue. We, no one wore masks because everyone was vaccinated and we were able to hug each other and enjoy each other's company and feel comfortable, as you pointed out, having reached that fully vaccinated status, being able to, to have those types of interactions. And so, and it also gets to your earlier question in terms of isolation. So as things stand, people can get up and they can go and they can have gatherings and they can go out in public. I think there is still some residual as things kind of get worked out and the language from CDC and the states become a little bit more clear because there seems to be a little bit of fogginess there uh, in terms of interacting in public spaces. Um, 
And so, you know, as another example, I, you know, I'm fully vaccinated when I'm walking out in public. So technically I probably could walk around without a face covering on, but I still do carry that practice um, to model, you know, that, that type of behavior for those who are unvaccinated. Um, so what I would say this is, is yes, you can get together with folks, particularly those who are fully vaccinated. Uh, and even when you are in a small gathering, again, that's limited in the sense of how many networks uh, or other households are involved, is there are opportunities to, to get together with folks, to socialize, to connect, um, plus minus with your face covering on. Um, you know, the consensus seems to be it's still, we're still recommending folks, particularly in larger gathering, gatherings or crowded spaces, particularly as capacity increases, that it's just good practice um, to still wear your face covering. But that's a long-winded answer to say that there are options for people to connect, to break through those concerns about isolation, because yes, those are real. And there are real opportunities to engage in meaningful ways, not just physically distancing ways, but actual, you know, physically touching people and, and having fellowship uh, in those types of environments. And have there been any cases of individuals who have been fully vaccinated and then became seriously ill from COVID? Uh, I have to take a closer look. I do know that there have been some breakthrough cases. Um, I would have to go back to get the exact number, you know, in terms of what that translates into into hospitalizations or severe cases. I mean, we know that there's there is rare breakthrough transmission, but we also I understand that even if you are have breakthrough transmission, you don't get seriously ill. So it's essentially 100 percent protection. That's that's my understanding. But I would appreciate, you know, if you if we, we'll have that conversation again. Yeah, if I may add, council member, uh, you, if you've been vaccinated and you're not around, uh, for example, like I, I still have young children, so and they can't be vaccinated yet, so I, I, I operate, a little, I have to operate a little bit differently. But for the most part, I feel entirely comfortable going out into the public space, indoors or outdoors. I'll still wear a face covering inside because that's still a CDC recommendation. But generally speaking, I went and did. I went to the Rio in Gaithersburg this past weekend. Was outdoors. Did you know? We did the carousel. We did the. You know, uh, walked along. We did indoor. We we did. I guess outdoor dining was on a patio, but but still counts as outdoor. But um, yeah, I think you the vaccines are quite effective. And I think over the weekend we saw a couple of the on the on the weekly news stations some of the you know some of the experts that we looked to saying essentially once you've been vaccinated, the risk from COVID nineteen is lower than the flu. Right. And so um, these vaccines are actually more effective than the flu vaccines, particularly the Western the West the you know the Johnson Johnson and both the the mRNA uh, vaccines, Pfizer and Moderna, are more effective than our annual flu vaccines are, and so people should feel pretty good. Now, obviously, we still can't vaccinate our, our our young people all the way yet, and so you know if you have young children, you probably take some additional precautions than you would others. But if you're a, if you're a senior and and you know you live uh, with with your your spouse or or uh, you know aren't exposed to children with regularity, you should feel pretty comfortable living your life and getting back to some of the things that you were doing. Uh, I do think as it relates to, um, I think your point about the isolation is absolutely correct. Uh, I think some of that is, is as you noted, a sort of self-imposed by, by being sort of conditioned for a year to feel hyper-cautious. And people should start to feel like with, the, with vaccines on board that you can do more things. That there would be no reason to be vaccinated if we couldn't do more things as a result of it. And I think that's sort of the point I would – Get to so people should feel more comfortable coming out and doing things with their families, with 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 others, just with just with themselves in, in in the public space now that they've been vaccinated. Thank you, thank you for saying that. I do think we need to encourage that. I just think that it's hard to absorb this now. It's a big okay. challenge. Thank you, hey, Councilman Rima. I just like to briefly speak on your question around our homebound vaccination program. We started with about thirteen hundred pre registrants for our homebound uh, vaccination program. We I reached out to our community partners who uh, supported a pilot just for those individuals who were homebound. Um, we had the, the uh, pause with the J&J uh, &J, uh, vaccine, and then we resumed. As I've updated the board, um, the council sitting as a board of health, we um, re-implemented uh, or implemented a, a uh, survey. We reached out. We called folks. We expanded that to not only vaccinate those homebound individuals, but their caregivers and families as well. Unfortunately, some of those individuals, when we call back, 
were hesitant to receive a vaccine. And we encourage all, if you receive a call from the Department of Health regarding uh, a vaccine, uh, please, please answer the call and uh, receive your vaccination. Uh, some folks have asked for the Moderna or the Pfizer vaccination uh, or the vaccine, and we have been accommodating folks, but we still have the Johnson & Johnson doses available. In addition to the homebound vaccine program, we continue to vaccinate those individuals who are not homebound, but who may be homeless and, and, and a transient in our services to end and prevent homelessness. And lastly, we continue to support the corrections department with vaccinating those individuals who um, unfortunately are uh, go through their system. And so all of those uh, programs and uh, activities are still in place. So it's the homebound vaccination program. And again, the most important part of that is that we encourage folks to get vaccinated with the vaccines that we have available. And if we call, please answer the call. Thank you. Just encourage you to beef that up. Glad you're doing it. Anything we can do to get through that final list here as quickly as possible. I know people will be immensely appreciative. Thank you so much. Appreciate that. Thank you, uh, Council Member Rice. Well, thank you very much. And thank you, Dr. Bridgers, uh, Dr. Kales, Dr. Stoddard for your tremendous work. Um, we couldn't have gotten to the place that we are right now if it weren't for the great work of you and all of the staff within HHS. So just thank you. Um, just very quickly, Dr. Gales, because I didn't get a chance to look at the number, how many people, right, not percentage, but how many number of people are still unvaccinated among those eligible? What's that number? Does anybody have that? I could do a quick and quick. So um, I think it's about, you have about 70% of eligible residents who have received a first dose. And I think that was 850,000 people. So if I pull out the calculator real quick, I can give you a, a, a rough um, number of people that that leaves. At least roughly 250,000-ish people who have not, among the eligible, who have not uh, chosen to come forward and get vaccinated. So a quarter million people, right? Um, that's, that's still a lot of folks. And so um, I would just ask those who continue to reach out to us and insist that we lift mask mandates and that we're continuing to open stuff to make sure you're reaching out to your neighbors, to your family, your friends, those that you know and you're encouraging them to get vaccinated. That is how we lift all of these things because that's a significant number of people who still are at risk, right? While the majority of us are vaccinated and are able to do the things like Dr. Gales talked about, like uh, Council Member Reamer talked about getting out, getting that uh, uh, socialization that is incredibly important. Um, you know, those, those are the things that we're all working towards getting to but those folks are standing in the way. Uh, and so we have to make sure that all of us are doing our part. It's not just the county council, but it's all of us as individual residents and friends and family, uh, you know, loved ones. Just encourage folks to continue to get vaccinated because that's going to allow for us to achieve what Council Member Reamer was talking about, which I agree with, which is that we all want to get back to that, that, that sense of normalcy, you know, to have, to be able to hug your family and be able to hang out with them again. We've got the summer upon us to be able to take a jog and not have to worry about anything. Well, the great way to do that is to become vaccinated. Uh, and Council Member Reamer, to an answer your question, because I had talked about this a couple of weeks ago, breakthrough cases are incredibly rare. I think it's, it's, it's one in which somebody equated it to winning the lottery and getting struck by lightning in the same day. <laughs> I don't know many people who that's happened to. And so it's very rare to, to have that and then have like a serious health complication, including death. It's incredibly rare. Uh, and so from that perspective, yes, the vaccination is your key uh, to your sense of normalcy. But it's not only the key to your sense of normalcy, but it's the key to all of our senses of normalcy. Uh, so let's not hold everyone back. Let's make sure that we continue to get vaccinated. And just a, another point, I already just in this, uh, Dr. Gales, you had mentioned about uh, being able to pre-register. Uh, while you said that, I pre-registered my daughter. 
Uh, so she's now pre-registered, so it does work. And just for the state site, Councilman Reamer, just to let you know, I actually went on prep mod to see if you could actually do it. And I think it was Dr. Stoddard who had mentioned this as well about people who got appointments. I'm not sure how they could because when I put in the date, uh, of birth, it said that she's not eligible. So unless they somehow manipulated the date, it's not allowing you to make an appointment for any of our mass vac sites. So I tried both uh, just to see what would happen. And so just want to give that feedback. So for folks, make sure you uh, pre-register for your young uh, uh, folks that are age 12 to 15. Pre-register, it works. It took me literally two and a half minutes to type it all in. And if you need assistance, we have programs that will allow you to do that, both with technology or you can call. Uh, let's make sure that we get our young people uh, vaccinated as well so that we can get even more of our kids uh, safely back into school in the fall. Thank you. Thank you, Council Vice President Albernoz. Thank you. Uh, good comments and questions and another positive report. Uh, we, we continue to make just tremendous progress in so many areas. Uh, just two questions today. The first is uh, Mayor Bowser announced uh, yesterday that the District of Columbia is shifting uh, some of the timeline that they had anticipated for some of their reopening. I was looking at uh, their reopening plan, and correct me if I'm wrong, Dr. Stoddard or Dr. Gales, their reopening plan seems very consistent with our phase three reopening. The only difference being on some level uh, with some adjustments that they're setting a specific date as opposed to our benchmark, which is based on the percentage of people vaccinated. But as you look at uh, line item by line item, their phase three, uh, our phase three versus what they announced yesterday are pretty consistent. Is that accurate? Yes, our phase three would largely be their, their second phase which would be June 11th because they still have 50% for, I believe, bars and other uh, venues as part of their first phase, which I believe is May 21st. So once they get to their final phase, they look exact, pretty much exactly like the phase three that we have um, as well. Terrific. Um, and, and obviously, as we've all noted, the regional approach to addressing these issues is continues to be critically important. So uh, we received some questions about that on our media call on Monday. Um, and so I think it may be helpful for us uh, in some form or fashion to just clarify or, or uh, let the public know that we're more aligned than it may seem um, um, as, you know, just folks that are just reading newspaper articles and not entirely focusing on this because um, I think that's important. Um, and then just the second question is, I mentioned this uh, last week as well, but now that uh, the, uh, the the imminent approval of the vaccine for 12, 15 year old, and, and now uh, just a question of when, but not if, um, but there was a report, again, the Today Show talked about it again this morning, that uh, on a national survey, about 30% of parents indicated that they would sign their children up as soon as possible. Uh, to receive the vaccination, but an alarmingly large percentage, almost also 30%, said they were going to wait and see, uh, which, you know, you can you can understand to a certain degree. But Dr. Gales, if, if you could just, both as a pediatrician, but also as our public health officer, uh, you're uniquely positioned here. Um, just any guidance that you may want to provide parents, uh, just, just any concerns that parents may have in their child uh, securing the vaccination, and obviously we want to encourage them to speak to their pediatrician, um, but if you could just um, make a couple points on that, I'd appreciate it. Sure. Thank you, Councilmember Albanos. Uh, before doing that, I would like to just add to your point, your first point that you made, uh, so that folks at home, again, are, are aware that we do talk with our colleagues across the region and across the state, uh, and, you know, when we were having our discussion about reopening and including vaccine metrics. Uh, you know, I did have some conversations with, you know, Dr. Nesbitt, who's DC's Department of Health Director, um, you know, to share with him what we were doing and to get some feedback. So we continue to work together as a, a, a region uh, to make sure that we're all on, uh, or as close as possible to being on the same page. Now, to pivot to your second point related to vaccine, uh, potential vaccine hesitancy in, in children for parents. Uh, the information that has been shown so far uh, has been overwhelmingly positive in terms of 
minimal side effects with children and no reported uh, significant uh, illnesses or uh, symptoms experienced by any of the children who were a part of the clinical trials uh, for the vaccine. It's important to note that uh, back in December, it seems like so long ago, well, back in December when uh, the EUA was granted for adults to get the vaccine, uh, the companies, uh, Pfizer included, began uh, clinical trials enrolling younger people in the age groups to be able to test out the safety of using the vaccine in those groups. And the data that they have received from those studies, again, have been overwhelmingly positive, have been consistent with the safety parameters that were found with the adults and the older populations that were approved and have been used in millions of vaccines distributed across the country and across the world with minimal uh, negative events and minimal side effects. So we encourage you to, um, you know, certainly again, have conversations with your healthcare provider to discuss your specific concerns but the information that we have available is overwhelmingly positive. It's overwhelmingly safe. Uh, and to Dr. Stoddard's point earlier, uh, the numbers in terms of safety and prevention of illness outpace some of the routine uh, pediatric vaccines that we already administer to children on a routine basis that have historically been extremely safe and extremely effective. Super helpful, very important. Uh, that's it for now. I yield back to you. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Friedson. Thank you, uh, echoing all the comments about the progress that we're making and appreciation for all of the hard work of the public health team, uh, Dr. Gale, Dr. Stoddard, Dr. Bridgers, everybody else in uh, the health department. Um, a few uh, questions, just building off some of the comments and questions that have been made up to this point. Um, the 47.5%, uh, which is the full dose schedule, uh, not necessarily fully vaccinated, but full dose schedule from the CDC. Do we have a timeline of when that's going to be shared publicly as part of the dashboards that residents can see it in real time? Yeah, the, they've been looking at the data set, uh, for the available data from CDC. I'm hoping that it's done up and up this week, but um, candidly, I'm, I'm now wondering whether we're going to get to 50% before it gets posted just because the data is, is a, just in a vastly different format than we have it. And they're trying to reconcile the, the two numbers, uh, the two the, the two data sets. Um, so um, no update on when it's going to happen, They're look, but they're actively looking at it now. It's just the CDC data is in a very different format than the immunet data, and so it's hard to, um, you know, get exact numbers. I mean, we, we're going to use the 47.5% just so we're clear, um, but, I, but I think that uh, displaying on our dashboard is becoming a challenge just because of the format the data is in. Uh, maybe I don't quite understand the back-end challenges of posting on the website, but why couldn't we just post three separate numbers? The the two numbers that we current have there, currently have there, which are based on those who've been vaccinated in Maryland, and then the CDC number, and note that the C, that the first number, which is the first dose number, which is the only number that we have, and then the CDC number, which is the you know uh, you know full dose schedule number, are the numbers that pertain to that order, and then explain what that means in terms yeah, of. It's just explaining all that on one dashboard is hard, so. Um, we, I mean, that, that's a fairly easy thing for us to do is just to post the third number. I just would expect that, that would be ex viewed as extremely confusing for many of our residents, given that we can't have, a, you know, we, we, there isn't a ton of space on the dashboard to have a lot of explainer for why data is different. And that's why it's, it's, uh, it's easy to tell a, a, a long story, but it's much harder to tell a short story. And I think that's the tricky thing that we face. So, I mean, we could, we could absolutely just post the CDC data and say the 47.5% number and update it you know, uh, on a daily basis, but obviously we would get tons of questions about, I, I, we would just get a lot of questions about it. We get a lot of questions about the data as is. And so I think people, it would be, people would, people, it would be very difficult to explain to people the, the nuances of, of the two separate numbers and why the third number, which is the first dose number, isn't also, that we don't have a CDC equivalent for that. We were trying to find one, but we don't have one. One of my favorite lines is I apologize for uh, the length because I didn't have time to write something shorter. Yeah. Um, so so yeah. I, I totally appreciate that and, and understand that and take to heart my own, uh, uh, you know, hits close to home sometimes uh, in terms of brevity. But um, 
I do think the numbers that people care about are the numbers that pertain to our orders, because those are the numbers that are restricting their lives. And so I do think that we have, to a certain extent, you know, all of us who have been so immersed in these issues, and you probably chief among them with Dr. Gales, Dr. Bridgers, um, we're kind of missing the, the, you know, the punchline here. And the punchline is, what does this mean for what the Board of Health has done and how does it impact my life? And so I, I think we should start there and then back into what is the best way to display the information that people are looking for and that they need. And I think right now we aren't displaying the information that they need. So I'd be happy to, you know, chat with you offline. I know that you're working hard on this, but I, I do think that, you know, the only data that matters to be posted in a clear way on the dashboard is the data that residents need to see in terms of how it impacts their life vis-a-vis -vis the Board of Health regulations. So I, I would just make a, a strong push for that to be the, the chief goal uh, and that we not let the perfect be the enemy of the information that people desperately need to see. Um, okay, so uh, related to that, um, the um, – Community partners, I visited a few of them. Um, many of them are, are doing all of the information by paper, and then presumably after the fact, somebody is going in and entering that data into Immunet or some other place. It, it, it's not quite as automated as uh, the health department and some of the other, you know, maybe even the pharmacy uh, clinics. Do we have an understanding of what the delay is from when Shots actually go into arms, first shots actually go into arms to the point at which it, it shows up in the data that, that we're seeing in Immunet and you're seeing in Immunet and that is being posted on, on the website. So thank you, Councilmember Friesen, for your question. Uh, we're required to enter that data within 24 hours, whether it's electronically or paper format, and that's the same uh, requirement we have, as you may recall from previous conversations, we did have some issues with some of our community providers weeks ago. We worked with them to clarify and correct that. And so, in fact, the majority of our providers are actually entering that in directly. And if they are using paper, it's still within a 24-hour period uh, with rare exception. So that information gets input fairly quickly. Um, you know, from when an individual received their shot into, you know, how it's referenced in the, the computer system. Okay, so with rare exception, we really couldn't be more than really 48 hours behind because it takes 24 hours to enter and then 24 hours to capture the update on, you know, publicly at noon every day or the time at which, you know, it gets done. So it, it, 48 hours or less. I, that's very helpful. I think a lot of people have asked that, so I think that, that helps to clarify that. I appreciate that. Um, <coughs> Excuse me. Um, the um, the issue of the, uh, uh, the the website and pre-registration. I just want to note that separately from the uh, the dashboard uh, issue. I just think it, there's an opportunity now to take a look at that. It's not clear. Uh, the, the the top part says that you can make an appointment now. The bottom part says you must be pre-registered in order to make an appointment. Now that there is a pre-registration, at least for a few days, for 12. To, to 15, I, I hope that we can get that updated today uh, and, and make very clear that if you're 16 and older, you can book your appointment immediately. If you're 12 to 15, pre-register. We expect, you know, you know, you know, you know, here's what we expect in terms of timing, in terms of youth clinics. You know, we, we expect parents to have to be with their, uh, uh, you know, minor child uh, in order to do it. You know, et, et cetera. I think that would be really helpful, and I think all of us need to work really hard to get that information out uh, as quickly as possible. Obviously, a lot of people are going to be wondering, they they saw the approval yesterday or the pre-approval, but it's not the full approval, and so we all just need to work hard uh, together. Your information here, uh, I think, is a really good start, and I think we need to, you know, amplify that and, and provide you with that microphone. But if you could take a look at the appointment page and the pre-registration page and just uh, work on clarifying that with, with the team, I think that would be uh, much uh, uh, appreciated. It also says that you can't share your appointment links, that your your appointment link is just for you. I think we changed that, and now we want people to share their appointment links because we don't have the same issues that we had before. And so there's just a lot of uh, – it, it, it could use a scrub uh, in terms of what the current uh, information uh, is, as I uh, reviewed it yesterday. 
And if I may, Council Member, because you, you you brought something you brought something to mind as well. Um, we have been receiving both at the at the county health department level, but also at the mass vaccination site level, um, Pfizer and Moderna doses to a, to an extent. So people will need to pay attention once the clinics are scheduled and when they go to make their own appointment as to which vaccine is available at a particular clinic. We don't have both vaccines at a single clinic typically because that's where our mistakes happen. Uh, and so if you see a Moderna clinic, then obviously that's going to be for an older age category of people. And so they need to, you know, not, you know, if you see a clinic and it's scheduled, we've actually tried to front load Moderna this week uh, so that we could have Pfizer doses at the end of the week available for presuming the 12 to 15 will be expanded, but that doesn't mean we'll have expended all of our Moderna doses. And I'm quite confident we'll be having Moderna doses one or two uh, at one or two clinics a week. Um, and so people need to realize that because we don't have exclusively Pfizer, um, there will be, you'll have to pay attention to what the particular clinic is that you're signing up for um, once you can make your own appointment, uh, particularly for that 12 to 12, really to 16, because Moderna, you can't do a 16 year old either. Appreciate that. Um, okay, quick um, additional question. The 12 to 15, do we have an understanding of how many people in that category? I know there's approximately 850,000 that are currently eligible. Do we have an understanding of how many people we're going to be adding uh, when the 12 to 15 officially become eligible in a couple days? Yeah, our best estimate is approximately 3 to 4% of the population, which would translate to 30 to 40, maybe 45,000 people. 35 to 40, I'd say 35 to 40,000 people is probably our best best estimate of what that population looks like uh, based okay. on the census data. So that brings a number up to like 880 to 890,000. Uh, yeah, I think it's actually about 871 right now that are eligible. I think if you did, you know, I think it's 83% of the population. We have, a you know, 1.05 million people. It's about 870. Uh, so if you add, 30, we're about 900,000 people that will be eligible after um, after uh, the CCX. Okay, great. Um, all right. I um, appreciate what uh, Council Member Albernaz, uh, Council Vice President Albernaz mentioned about the D.C. Uh, uh, numbers. I think it would be helpful for us to think through, you know, based on the current timeline of where that puts Montgomery County vis-a-vis -vis D.C. I think it's much more similar than uh, it may have seemed at, at first Blush. I think it's easier for people to comprehend a very specific date, and and so you know I think there's a little bit of misunderstanding there. But I do think in reality uh, they're they're pretty similar. Would you would you agree with that? Just to reiterate, what uh, you know, not not just that our phase three and their second phase are are quite similar, but that the timeline May 21st and then later on in June um, that we would be around that point uh, uh, most likely. Yes, I would agree. Okay. I think we'll be at our second phase before they get to their next phase, which is May 21st. I think we'll be there before May 21st. I think we'll be at our third phase before uh, the June 11th time frame. We're at 47.5% we're as you noted on the CDC dashboard. We've been going up about 0.6% per day. So I would guess by early next week, we've reached our, our CDC threshold, which would start that two week clock. And so right by the end of June is what I'm you know, maybe the first week of, you know, sorry, end of end of May, let me clarify. I think right by the end of May, we'll be there or the or the first week of June for that last phase. Great. And I, I just would like to add this. So this is just a, a continued note for folks at home. This is dependent upon folks coming in and getting vaccinated. So we need you to come in and get vaccinated. So what we're talking about, for, I would say, yeah, I know we've had some disagreements about numbers throughout the pandemic, but here's a clear one. Our reopening metrics are tied to the percentage of folks vaccinated. You control your destiny on that one. So please, if you haven't been vaccinated, get vaccinated. If you have family members or people in your network, get vaccinated. Yes, the ultimate reason to get vaccinated is to protect yourself and protect your health. But as been laid out by you, Councilmember Friedson, and your colleagues, this is the key to us being able to move forward safely and ensure that we don't have to take steps back. Well, there is absolutely no disagreement anywhere here or in county leadership on that. We've had uh, small disagreements on small issues, but there's universal agreement on that. So thank you for uh, reiterating that. Last question, I promise. Uh, outdoor transmission. There is a ton of confusion with the CDC and with lots of conflicting information on how prevalent outdoor transmission is, whether under 10 percent or under 1 percent. You know, under 1 percent is under 10 percent technically, but 
it's quite different. Could you just explain to us what you're operating under based on the guidance that you're providing us and the guidance you're providing uh, to uh, the, the county executive, uh, the school system, and, and others based on what our operating assumption is of uh, how prevalent outdoor transmission is with COVID-19? Well, I think the most important thing is whether 10% or 1%, I, I can't speak for CDC in the specific doctrines that they looked at, but we do know that when you are in, whether you're in outdoor or indoor places, when you're in close contact with other individuals within that a short amount of space that yes, you can transmit from person to person and, you know, unvaccinated people in particular. So again, we, you know, I think the most productive conversation around this is looking at the types of activities that are involved. If I'm standing on one side of a football field and you're standing on another one, yeah, it's extreme. We're not going to transmit from person to person, but if we are within, you know, several feet of each other, not covered, not, not wearing any mask, we're not within each other's households and networks of, 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 you know, traditional networks, the, the risk of spreading through outdoor transmission is significantly higher. So I think it depends on the type of interaction and depends on the type of, of spacing and those kinds of things, which would influence the risk of transmission from person to person. Now, certainly the risk in an outdoor setting is smaller than if you're in an indoor setting where ventilation is different and you're in an enclosed environment. But I, I, I think that is, Unfortunately, the, the the wording that CDC used has created confusion within that. But I think the most beneficial conversation around is the type of activity and the, the, the type of interaction that people have that influence the risk of transmission uh, more so than, you know, just throwing out a general number. I would completely agree. I think Dr. Gels has answered this phenomenally. I think um, it's not an outdoor versus indoor. I think the one thing we have to realize is we've we've largely either discouraged people or in some cases prevented people from having large outdoor gatherings where they're in close concert. And so therefore outdoor transmission, if you look at the whole history of the pandemic has been very rare because we've limited those opportunities as Dr. Gales has said, where the transmission is likely to occur outdoors, which is in close proximity, large gatherings outdoors. Because we haven't had many of those, outdoor transmission is likely very rare, but if you allow more of those outdoor gatherings of, of with people in close contact, you may see that that you're seeing more transmission in those circumstances uh, with unvaccinated people. But I think we all agree that it is, it is orders of magnitude safer to do things outside than it is to do them inside. Um, and so I think, you know, generally speaking, People should do outdoor activities and feel good about them, um, about good about doing them. If there are large gatherings, we would still encourage face coverings to be worn in those circumstances. I don't think face coverings are this huge burden that um, you know um, you know we should be able to do these events and do them safely. If you if you have smaller events, as Dr. Gales alluded to with his family, you don't need to wear the face coverings in, in those smaller events, particularly when everyone's been vaccinated. Um, um, if you're if you're unvaccinated, you probably should still be wearing the face covering. But again, he just encourages you to come and get vaccinated, and then you can, you know, we'll have more more, more people with which to uh, to do all kinds of activities um, without masks and other things. So, uh, yeah, I think in summary, outdoor much safer. Outdoor close contact with other people is probably still something you should um, you know be wearing a face covering for, particularly if you're unvaccinated. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, uh, Councilmember Juwanda. Thank you. Good morning, uh, and as always, thanks for all the work that you all are doing and, and great, uh, great updates. I just wanted to touch on uh, the progress uh, and any updates and conversations that you've had uh, with uh, with MCPS uh, regarding. Uh, as we move into obviously next year, uh, we've gotten through the various stages of opening. Uh, is there any discussion around the, the guidance for distancing and, uh, you know, those kind of how we might be able to put, get more kids in the building? Obviously, the, the conversation we've been having about vaccinations is critically important. We need to get those as many young people vaccinated as soon as possible as they're allowed. Uh, here, hopefully, starting this week. But could you just give an update? I think that's a question we all receive at various points in time from 
many residents and just kind of where those conversations are and what the latest is there. Thank you, Council Member Jawando. You are right. We get a lot of those similar questions uh, returning to that. Uh, I, what I can say is, so as far as I know, there have not been any updated guidelines from what the CDC has put forward and the state has put forward uh, approximately a month, a month ago related to those distancing guidelines, you know, six feet in universal places and three feet confined to the instructional classroom setting. Uh, now, that said, I do know that uh, MSDE uh, and MDH are working on, you know, new guidance as the percentage of residents covered by the vaccine increase. And certainly as young people do get those opportunities, and there will be an increase in the percentage of those folks who are covered and protected within that. And there have been initial conversations, including uh, the health officers for feedback to talk about what this school look like in the fall. I think all of us are working under the assumption and working with the plan and, and, and motivation to be able to get all of our kids back into school safely at regular capacity. Uh, and so I do anticipate over uh, the course for the next month or so, uh, that there will be uh, further studying of those best practices that have been put into place over the last six months to minimize transmission. There will be a better understanding and hopefully a higher percentage of folks covered by the vaccine, again, including the young people. And then I think over or during the same time period, I think there will be further conversation and guidance from the, the, the federal level as well as the state in terms of how those distancing parameters may be relaxed or changed or altered. Um, but in consensus, I think that all of our collective energy and efforts um, are to be able to get kids fully back in the classroom in the fall, um, you know, pending obviously uh, no further changes or, you know, What's the best word to put it? No, no things to deter no, us no from that. Yeah, no, no setbacks. There we go. No setbacks. That's what I was looking for. No setbacks within that. But that is, I think, okay. the collective effort and energy and desire to get everybody back in. Well, I, I appreciate that. And I think that's an important statement. You know, again, we, we talked earlier in this process about kind of putting the light at the end of the tunnel. I think, you know, that was one of the clearest statements I've heard, that that is the intention in the fall that all students return to school. Um, and we're heading in that direction, and conversations are happening at the federal, state, and local level to update guidance and to continue the vaccination process, right, uh, where we are to make that happen. Um, and again, to your point, we have some control over this, right? The more people get vaccinated, the better uh, uh, all of this becomes for everybody. But, you know, having just entered, you know, as many of my colleagues, having kids in the school system, just entering the, the last quarter of the year, you know, people are trying to figure out what are they going to do for summer. Uh, we had a robust discussion um, here at the Education Culture and uh, uh, the Fed Committee and, and the whole council, really, about what are the summer supports that are going to be in place. Um, and I think knowing that we can get, you know, move towards removal of these flex schedules and getting all kids back in the building, and that's where we're going, is, is really important. So the sooner we can provide actual, you know, confirmation of that, obviously, School system is, you know, is in the state school board uh, are going to have to speak on that. But I just think it's really an, important to send that signal that that's where we're heading to folks. So for, I appreciate you you saying that. Um, uh, I guess my last question, uh, many have been asked. Uh, I had asked a few weeks ago about some of the targeted. There was a really dark red area in that map, kind of the up in the upper East County. Um, and there's some other areas, and it's obviously while we're making improvement, it's, you know, some of them are stubbornly, persistently red. And I, and I, I was happy to hear about the strike teams, looking forward to hear more about that. Um, but can you uh, get to us, two, two questions, you know, just kind of what those communities are and what exactly is happening and what are the strategies that you're using in some of those places where it's just been stubbornly persistent? Because I think we all could have ideas or community partners that we send anyway, but I just really want to get down to the, the community level of understanding where those are and what's going on uh, across the county. So you can speak to it now, but I think as a follow-up, I would really like to know, you know, what's going on in those areas. Sure. So I, I think the, the longer answer is yes, we, we will follow up with you and provide that data. The short-term answer is we've been looking at that for some time, you know, based upon the conversation that we had 
Um, and so one of the things that we've tried to do is to help to use that to inform, you know, when we have had opportunities, for example, when FEMA has said we've got resources or the state mobile team has had resources, we've been trying to uh, position some of those clinic opportunities in, the, or in, in those areas or adjacent to those areas to provide further opportunities. Uh, that's been the short-term solution to help drive up the numbers. And you're right, the larger conversation is doing a deeper dive for, you know, any other community factors. And within that, we'll be happy to have the team do that, complete that deeper dive and provide you with the data, and we can engage in that further conversation. Great. Thank you. Thanks for everything that you all are doing. All right. Uh, and Oh, and just to the public, I'll say, we we traveled uh, to New York to see, uh, surprise my wife's mother for the first time, first time we had traveled anywhere. Everyone was vaccinated. Uh, we hugged people for the first time in a year. Uh, there's really benefits to getting vaccinated. So um, so just would encourage everyone to continue to do that. So thank you. Indeed. Okay, Council Member Glass. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Uh, thank you, doctors, uh, for another very encouraging update. You know, last week, uh, you told us that 54% of residents had received one dose. This week, you're telling us that 56% have received a first dose. And now we know that there are about uh, 35 to 45,000 more residents, ages 12 to 15, who are going to be eligible for these doses. So we're quickly going to be reaching the 60% threshold uh, so that we can lift more restrictions and get back to normal. So these, this is all good stuff. And as uh, you have all said, and my colleagues have all said, if we want to get back to normalcy, uh, we need each of our residents to get vaccinated. We need them to get their family members vaccinated, their coworkers, their neighbors, because that is the key to having a, an open and safe community. And so uh, I'm going to stop there and just thank you all. And uh, I know that we will have more conversations about the 12 to 15 year olds. Uh, and I'm sure parents are already starting to hit refresh on the various websites. So uh, I'll stay tuned for those updates from you all as we prepare for them and prepare to, to uh, get everybody healthy, safe and reopened. So thank you all for everything that you've been doing. Thanks, Councilmember Reamer. Thank you. I uh, appreciated the questions Councilmember Jawando was asking about the fall, and I just wanted to kind of follow into that. I totally understand Dr. Gales's response because you know there there are various issues that he's working through. Um, I think it's really important for us to be clear about our expectation, which is that school will be full capacity in the fall. Uh, I, I just can't foresee any reason that school would be partial capacity. And I don't think there is a chance that it will be partial capacity. I, I firmly and clearly, truly believe it will be 100% with the exception of those few students who want to do a virtual academy. The recent work to design the virtual academy may be creating the impression that they're seeking to have a fallback that would, you know, apply to a large number of students. But, uh, you know, we've got to we've got to send out a message to the families like this fall. It's going to be and I know we don't control this because we're not the Board of Education, but we do have a platform, you know, that we, we expect that it'll be full capacity. I mean, my my sons, of course, are in school and it's shocking to me. My my middle schooler is sitting in classes with three or four children. You know, that's that's as many kids as he has in the classroom now. And. Um, you know, we've got to get past this one group of students one week, another group another week. There's very little incentive for families, frankly, to return their kids to school in this environment anyway. Um, so I don't know how we can do it, but I just think sending out a clear message to the community this fall, full time, all students, you know, if that's, that's what we're going to do. A lot of school districts, of course, have been in all the, all the way. Um, so there should be plenty of science to, to rely upon by then. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councilmember Rice. Yeah, Dr. Gales, I just I just wanted to follow up on one of the things um, regarding the vaccination because there's been a lot of uh, misinformation out there about the type of vaccination that our young people would get, ages 12 to 15, and whether it's uh, the same, you know, two frequency. Could you talk about what uh, the dose is 
Is it the same as what adults receive? Uh, scheduling time frame, is it still the same as what adults? Can you just lay all of that out for us? Sure. Uh, and thank you for the reminder. I think we sometimes, we just assume that people know what we're saying. Well, you're going to get Pfizer, you're going to get this, is that people are familiar with that. So thank you uh, for the reminder to explain that. So uh, to take a step back, as you know, there have been three vaccines that we have used here in the U.S. Uh, that has been the Pfizer dose, which is a two-dose regimen, Moderna, a two-dose regimen, and the Johnson Johnson and Janssen dose, which is a one-dose regimen. All of those have been approved by the FDA and CDC for individuals 18 and up. Throughout the pandemic, though, the Pfizer vaccine, due to their clinical trial, was approved for 16 and up, just the Pfizer one, the two-dose regimen. And for 16 to 18-year-olds, they received the same dose as adults under the same schedule. Now, to date, all of them have been, I think, to some degree, doing clinical trials on younger people to be able to be used. Pfizer is the only one who has submitted their application, which was preliminarily approved by the FDA on yesterday, and will get an official hearing by ASAP, the Committee on Immunization Practices, on tomorrow for full final approval. Once that happens, the Pfizer two-dose regimen will be open and eligible for those 12 to 15. And so the parameters in terms of the dose as well as the frequency and the need for two doses will be the same for that 12 to 15 year old group as are the older groups. So when your child, if your parent watching at home, or if you are a child, uh, and again, as a pediatrician, all everyone under 24 is a child to us, so don't be offended if I'm calling you as a teenager a child, but the child also, uh, if you've got questions about it, you will need to get two doses and the time frame within them will still be approximately three weeks. Thank you very much, Dr. Gales. I think that's just important for the parents that are uh, certainly watching at home. And just to follow up on a point that Councilmember Reamer made, uh, MCPS was very clear that they are returning to full uh, school in the fall. They sent out that announcement to all parents uh, via uh, text message, their website. Uh, so they are very clear as to what is going on now of course we don't know what the future holds um, but based on the trajectory and everything that we have there's no reason to assume that it would be different from uh where we are right now and so you know we're very happy to see that we know the benefits that that's going to mean for our children uh and really want to thank the board of education and the superintendent for putting out that message early uh so that parents know that they are intending on full school in the fall in-person learning with supports for those who still may need to remain home for various types of reasons. So, thank you. Thank you, and apologies to Council Member Navarro, who I skipped earlier. Yeah, like 45 minutes ago, but. Oh, I'll make it up. Okay, well, a lot of my questions have been answered already. And um, so, you know, so much appreciate uh, the team. This, this is uh, both extraordinary and at the same time as we're now trying to figure out those uh, very important next steps. I think uh, it's, it's going to require perhaps for us to have some other conversations. Um, the question that I had had really to do with how, you know, how specific uh, are we in terms of the analysis uh, of where those 250,000 folks might be? You know, are there any patterns uh, as it had been asked before? Do we know? How, you know, where specifically, um, any particular communities? I mean, as we have been so proactive in addressing our black and brown communities, do we see that perhaps we're going to have to do a little bit more, uh, in those areas? And I'm really interested as, as we're, of course, going through budget and then when the ARPA funds begin to come through, do we need to strengthen some of those areas? Um, so, you know, if you have any thoughts right now that you can share, that'd be great. I know that you mentioned to council member Gerondo that you wanted to, that you would kind of circle back with us, but, but I'm just very curious because I, I think we have such great templates that we could just, you know, target more, enhance more, um, and then get those numbers up so we can begin to, to open up, uh, uh, much, much faster. Any, any, any thoughts in terms of just general patterns that you're seeing? 
Uh, thank you, Councilmember Navarro, uh, for that question. And certainly that'll be a part of that analysis that, you know, I spoke with Councilmember Duwando about. I think one of the things that we are missing, because as you mentioned, we've got a pretty robust infrastructure to address a lot of those other social determinants and barriers. Um, and, you know, thank you to you all. Thank you to the county exec's office. Thank you to our community partners for collective engagement around that to build that system and to continue to build that system to do that. I think in some places, one of the areas where we haven't really factored in as much is, is where there are ideological differences around vaccine hesitancy um, in terms of, I do think we have some pockets of folks within our county who, you know, for whatever reason, ideologically or politically, who aren't interested in the vaccine. And so I don't, that's the one piece, not to say that's the only reason why we've got that, but I think the piece where we've probably, that is a little bit more underdeveloped in understanding what the real impact of that is. And I think we've got to think through a little bit, how do we address that and how do we move forward? And I think there's varying degrees of that hesitancy. I think there is on one hand, into the spectrum, kind of a, we're going to continue to wait and see how it goes, as I think uh, Councilmember Reamer referenced, or maybe it was Councilmember Albert else, where there was 30% of parents who said, I'm going to wait and see how it goes before I do it. So I think we do have some of that where people are interested in it, but they're still a little skeptical and waiting for further results. And on the other, other end of the spectrum, I think there's some folks who are just, you know, maybe anti-vaccine. Um, and just not interested in the vaccine for whatever reason, um, you know, that's, that's less about the science and more about, you know, ideology. So I say all that to say that I think we've got to include that as we do the analysis, where I think we've focused a lot of our energy, rightfully, in terms of removing those barriers for those who are interested in getting vaccinated to make sure they have those opportunities. Um, but and to continue that, but also have a better understanding of this this other phenomena, so that we can think through, as you mentioned, how to leverage those resources we have in place already to address that, and what new tools we need to pull out to be able to to reach the concerns of that population. Thank you, um, and I'm sure, of course, that the hubs um, can provide some really good feedback to us. So I would be really curious about that, Dr. Sauter. I'm sorry, you were going to say something. Yeah, we are looking at, so we do have information about who's been vaccinated by zip code, and we are looking at, so basically, you know, not just, we have data about not just population total, but, you know, percentage of population that is minority, for example, and uh, what is the relationship between the vaccination rate and the major and the population, uh, minority population that's been vaccinated or not. And so we can start to see some of those breakdowns. And, and candidly, there are places where we've we've totally or, or nearly eliminated the minority gap, but still the percentage is too low, meaning that it's there's there's some other, other dynamics going on there. And so um, uh, I think every, you know, every zip code has a little bit of its own story about, you know, this zip code is coming out at high levels, but there's a, there's a, there's a larger than average uh, gap in our black and brown populations, but this, you know, in other places where fewer people are coming in, but there's no gap. And so there's some interesting characteristics that uh, uh, each zip code and then everything in between. So we've got areas where we've actually got more, a greater portion of the population in the in the black and brown community is vaccinated than the than than is reflected in the in the, in the community, and um, you know it's sort of there's very each each zip code or each area of the county has its own separate story, and so we are absolutely looking at those, and that's that helped us with the targeting of our text text me, text messaging campaign, mm -hmm. with the targeting of our outreach campaigns, and so um, you know. Um, we could go almost zip code by zip code and tell a little bit of, of an interesting different story about where everything's at, but certainly we'll take a look more at those places that appear right on the map where the, the rate is, is substantially below the average county rate, and that's that's actually where most of many, much of the efforts are focused. I appreciate that. I think that it sounds like a really awesome strategy um, and can give us really rich information about, you know, tailoring and targeting. And, of course, uh, another thing that hopefully will help us is that our very own Chef Jose Andres has offered an extraordinary incentive for people that go to his uh, restaurants or are fully vaccinated. And uh, I know it's been talked about nationally, um, continue to be so grateful to his innovative uh, ta uh, tactics and his extraordinary contributions, not only to our county, but really the region and, and the country. So uh, 
you know, if, if, if maybe you need a little push, maybe that's another really great incentive because of course his restaurants are awesome. So a little plug there for Chef Jose Andres, who is uh, furthering public health uh, and vaccinations uh, throughout, throughout the, the region and the country as well. We actually have to go back and rethink my vaccine status just to qualify for that. So kudos, thank you. <laughs> well, I was thinking about that as well. And the last thing I will say is that my household is now finally vaccinated, fully vaccinated. And it was wonderful to celebrate Mother's Day um, in such a way. But, you know, what Councilmember Reamer was alluding to, um, it, it is true. You know, I, I personally um, have felt that, you know, that my outings were very specific, you know, to the grocery store to just run a very important errand. And it was, you know, my, my young adult daughters literally had to say, mom, we need, we need to take you out for Mother's Day because, you know, you're fully vaccinated, mom, it's okay. And, but it's true. You get into this sort of psychological space where you're trying to be so extremely careful. And I think especially for our elderly, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a big burden um, psychologically and emotionally. And, uh, and, and I think, yes, to the extent that we could begin to send some signals out there about, you know, how, how safe it is. And it's okay if you're fully vaccinated. And after those, you know, two, three weeks, you can start venturing out and enjoying. And it, and it was, and it was a wonderful Mother's Day. And I'm glad I, I, I ventured out of my comfort zone. So. Excellent. Happy Mother's Day. Um, Dr. Stoddard, that's an intriguing answer. Uh, if every zip code has its own uh, little micro story, are there two or three that you, examples you could give us? Um, sure. I'm sort of looking at the data set here, and I, I apologize. So, for example, um, let's take um, – so 20903 is a good example. So that's Hillendale uh, listed here. Uh, only, yeah, only about 31% of the population there has been vaccinated, and there's still a large gap between uh, the, the between the percentage of minority population and the percentage of minorities that have been vaccinated in that region. So that's an area where we've got to do our, our traditional uh, equity-focused uh, efforts. But you contrast that with, for example, um, other parts of the county where um, – Dickerson, for example, is at 53% overall vaccinated, but the rate of minority vaccination or, 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 or black and brown residents is 25% above the percentage that would be reflected by the population. And so um, going just down the list, there's, there's stories like that across the board where there's areas where there are higher vaccination rates, and I'll give you so Bethesda, for example, 2814. Uh, um, we're at 65% of the percentage of the population that's received at least one dose, and we're 5% above the percentage that you would expect uh, according to minority population. And, you know, that there's similar stories like that across the board. The same story is in, you know, in, in Durwood, 20855, we're 70% first doses and uh, 7% above the, 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 what you would expect based on population for the minority population. And so it's sort of a little bit all over the map in terms of where you see, um, you know, places where we're higher than the average of the county and also higher in, in population reflected, you know, uh, minority, you know, minority vaccination rates. Um, so it's sort of, um, there's interesting stories to observe here in the data. And uh, the team is using those to sort of target where where we spend uh, more of our, our more of our time and effort and, and energy trying to you know target different populations based on what the data is telling us is happening in those zip codes. And so, Council President Hucker and Council Member Navarro, just to add to what Dr. Stoddard and Gail shared, we have been in conversations, and as Dr. Gail's indicated, um, as part of that. Um, uh, hesitancy strategy in collaboration with the University of Maryland are looking at the data, and we know that the top three data points identify those individuals who may have health literacy challenges and who may be uninsured. So one of the strategies that we targeted and, and focused on was having our femur strike teams to go back into those uh, highly prioritized zip codes so that we know that individuals who are in those comfortable and known spaces are more likely to return for their second Bills, as opposed to having them go to another site that may be outside of their 
comfort space. And so all of these targeting strategies within the zip codes are part of that strategy to increase our vaccination rates and to get more folks um, vaccinated and more shots in arms. I just wanted to share that picture as we look at the triangulation of all the data points to get more folks vaccinated. Okay, um, that's very helpful and interesting. I, I, uh, Dr. Snyder, I'll give you a call about Hillendale. Um, I have a number of suggestions there. Okay, uh, any other questions from colleagues or comments? All right, uh, thank you all again for all your tremendous work. We're making a lot of progress and uh, we're really grateful. Thanks and we'll see you again soon. <clears throat> Now we can take up the consent calendar. Is there a motion to approve the consent calendar? So moved. Second. Council Member Rice moves. Council Member Reamer seconds the consent calendar. Uh, all right, all those in favor, please raise your hand. That is unanimous. All right, we have an approved consent calendar and we can now take recess until 1.30. Thank you all. <laughs>